In the opening two chapters of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon went on a search, a search for satisfaction under the sun and apart from God. Now, spoiler alert, he searched high and he searched low, but he could not find satisfaction in the things of this world. And the reason why is because true satisfaction can only be found in the Lord. Open your Bibles and join me in the book of Ecclesiastes as we study the search for satisfaction. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We're starting a brand new series today on the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is an interesting book. It's one of the hardest books in the Bible to make sense of because people read the opening of the book of Ecclesiastes and say, what in the world? All is vanity? All is meaningless? All is empty? That sure doesn't seem to fit into the Bible. And the preacher is the one saying it, so it really seems odd. You know, if a preacher visits with the pastor search committee and they uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, well, he just said, you need to know, uh, this is how I preach, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, it's all a waste of time, it's all meaningless, he probably wouldn't get the position, right? Because we'd say, uh, you need to go back to seminary, there is something wrong with your theology. Well, we're, we're entitling this series, Life Under the Sun. Because in the book of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, King Solomon, the son of David, he uses that phrase 29 times, under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. And what he means by that is he's going to look at life, keeping God out, keeping heaven out, just look at life under the sun. What is life like from a human and a humanistic perspective. I'm not considering God. Uh, I am just considering what is here on planet earth, what I can do under the sun. And he's trying to find this elusive thing called satisfaction. Everybody wants satisfaction. Mick Jagger wants satisfaction, but he can't get no satisfaction. Uh, and, and Mick Jagger would really fit into the book of Ecclesiastes because he says, I can't get no satisfaction because I try and I try and I try and I try. I can't get no. No, no, no. I, I can't get it. <laughs> and that's what Solomon is going to tell us, that under the sun, you can't get no satisfaction. Life apart from God is vain. It is meaningless. It is empty. Now, when you keep that in your mind under the sun, this is how the book of Ecclesiastes approaches things. Now, Ecclesiastes, the word means uh, assembly or one who assembles. And theologians have said this, this Ecclesiastes title, it's one who assembles sayings or one who addresses an assembly. I think both of those fit together. It's one who addresses an assembly, and he has assembled sayings about life. And our author of the book of Ecclesiastes is Solomon, the son of David, king in Israel. And it fits because this is a, a book of wisdom literature, and Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. And so he is going to tell us, in the first two chapters, tell us about life as he goes on this search for satisfaction. You know, I looked up satisfied in the Bible, and I love what it says about Abraham. It gives us this summation of Abraham's life. Genesis 25, verse 8, it says, And Abraham breathed his last 
in a ripe old age, he was 175, I would say he's pretty ripe, in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life. Hey, he was somebody that found satisfaction, but he found it in the Lord. He didn't find it under the sun. So Solomon is going to go on a search, and he tells us about this search. He gives us his executive summary of the search in verses 12, 13, and 14. He said, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. You might want to jot this down. When was he king? From 970 A.D. to 931 A.D. Solomon was born in 990. So he didn't have a real long life, um, but he was king for those years, 40 years. He said, I've been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which, I have, which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. Tells us right up front. He said, listen, I, I'm going to tell you about this search I went on, but you need to know up front, spoiler alert, it's all meaningless. It's all empty. It's all vanity. That word is used a lot in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's used 62 times in the Old Testament. Hevel is the Hebrew word. That's what Abel in Genesis 4, his name was Hevel. And so it is used 62 times, and half of those times, roughly half of those times, it's used in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's translated vanity. It's translated uh, futility, emptiness. It, it carries, it, it's just a breath. Uh, somebody said, what is vanity? It's taking a soap bubble and popping the soap bubble, and what is left after you pop the soap bubble, that is vanity. Well, there's just, there's just nothing there. It's just a little uh, puff of air. That's what Solomon says about life. Now, here's the thing to remember. Solomon is the richest man who ever lived. You say, oh, he's not rich like Jeff Bezos. Yes, way richer than Jeff Bezos. Solomon, somebody did a study on Solomon's life, and they said, if you look at all his wealth and you put it in today's terms, how rich would Solomon be? He would be a multi-trillionaire. He's worth, his net worth in today's money, according to this one historian, $2.3 trillion. Jeff Bezos, he's got like a hundred and something billion dollars, the guy that runs uh, Amazon. Boy, he's like a street beggar compared to Solomon. Solomon, the richest man, the wisest man. God gave him wisdom and understanding and knowledge like the sand on the seashore, breath of mind like the sand on the seashore. So here's a guy. He is more rich than your mind can comprehend. He is more uh, he has more brain power and insight and understanding than all of us put together times a thousand. He, he's, God just gave that to him. He is the king of Israel. He, when he looks at a situation, he looks at it from top to bottom, every nook and every cranny. He's going to study a situation and an area to find satisfaction far better than you can, far better than I can, far better than we ever could. And it's almost as if he travels down these roads and he goes all the way to the very end and he says, that road is a dead end. I traveled all the way down the road looking for what? Satisfaction. It's not found here. It's not found here. It's not found here. It's not found here. All of those are dead ends. So you know what? Don't look down that road for satisfaction. That is what he tells you and me. All is vanity and striving, chasing after wind. Well, you say, well, what did he try? What was he looking for? What, what areas did he explore to find satisfaction under the sun? Six areas that I want to share with you from Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2. First area, satisfaction is not found in wisdom and knowledge. That's what Solomon learned. It's not found there. Look what he says in verse 16. 
I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge, and I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I realized that this also is striving after wind, because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Now, Solomon put his great mind to study. He was going to study and study and study. And Solomon knew so much about so many things. He, he knew about biology and zoology and physics and horticulture and agriculture and philosophy. There wouldn't be a subject you could talk to him about that he wouldn't know more than you did about that subject because he just poured his uh, huge mind that God gave him insight. He poured it into those subjects. He was hitting the books, trying to find. He was taking that road all the way down to the end. Is there satisfaction in wisdom and in knowledge and in learning? And he said, no, you're not going to find it there. Now, learning is good. It's good to have knowledge, but you're not going to find satisfaction there. Actually, he says, Increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Now, I don't know if Solomon was the one that came up with ignorance is bliss, but that's kind of what he is saying here. You're not going to find satisfaction in learning and knowing all about the subjects. Malcolm Muggeridge, who was an English journalist and satirist, he said this, education, the greatest mumbo-jumbo and fraud of the ages, purports to equip us to live and is prescribed as a universal remedy for everything from juvenile delinquency to premature senility. For the most part, it serves to enlarge stupidity, inflate conceit, enhance credulity, and put those subjected to it at the mercy of brainwashers. Well, that's kind of negative. He would fit in really well with vanity of vanity, says the preacher, or all is vanity. But that is... Education. Now, it's good to get an education, but if you've been keeping up with what's going on on our university campuses, education has been poisoned, and it's hitting our uh, grades, high schools and middle schools and grade schools, and uh, we have uh, insane things happening at the school. Drag queen story hour. What in the world is that? That is not education. But, but education, the educational system has been poisoned. Hey, Solomon's talking about true education. He's talking about really understanding things, but he said you're never going to find satisfaction there. So he says, okay, I tried that. It's vain. But I'm not going to quit. I, I think I'm going to try something that is totally opposite of just studying and pouring over the books. I'm going to try something totally opposite of that. So he tries the second area. He goes down the second road, and that's the road of laughter and amusement. It's the road of just having a big old time. Life is just a bowl of cherries, so to speak. And he said, I'm going to see if I can find satisfaction in, uh, it wasn't in learning, but maybe it's in laughter. Chapter 2, verse 1, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? No doubt Solomon could gather together the best comedians. And the, the greatest comedians that lived on the, in, on the world, in the world on that, in that day, he could gather them to his palace. Okay, entertain me. And he could have uh, big parties and, and uh, entertainment and amusement. And he went down that road and he said, I'm just going to try and laugh at life. But he couldn't do it. He said, this is madness. This is empty. You know, you can laugh, but then the laughter fades, and, and then what do you have? You just have real life. And he said, there's no satisfaction in that. You know, the Bible says, Proverbs 14, 13, even in laughter, the heart may be in pain, and the end of joy may be grief. Isn't it interesting that many of the comedians of our day are people that make us laugh, 
but they're people who are hurting on the inside. Many of them are depressed. Many of them are into drugs and alcohol. You think of uh, funny man John Belushi and the fact that he was addicted to drugs that ended up killing him. Chris Farley, uh, drugs that ended up uh, killing him on an overdose. Mitch Hedberg, a funny comedian, ended up dying of an overdose. Robin Williams, who is considered one of the greatest comedians of our generation. How did he kill himself? How, how did he die? He killed himself. He hung himself. The, the guy that makes everybody laugh, even in laughter, the heart may be in pain, and the end of joy may be grief. Hey, satisfaction, laughter is good. A merry heart does good like a medicine. We had Tim Hawkins here last Sunday night. He was very funny. That was a fun time. And, and here's the thing. Learning is good. Laughter is good. They're not the source of satisfaction. And that is what Solomon is finding out. So he says, okay, I didn't find it in wisdom and knowledge. I didn't find satisfaction in laughter and amusement. So now let me try a stimulant. And he looks into drugs and alcohol to find satisfaction. But alas, satisfaction is not found down the road of drugs and alcohol. He says in verse 3, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I'm going to stimulate myself with wine, with alcohol, with some kind of a stimulant to see maybe I need this stuff and maybe this is going to satisfy me. But it doesn't satisfy. You have sorrows in life? Well, maybe you could drown your sorrows in alcohol. Hey, guess what? Your sorrows can swim. Uh, you're not going to be able to drown them in alcohol, in drugs, in some kind of a, a stimulant. You know, drugs and alcohol, those things are instant heaven that lead to everlasting hell. The Bible says wine is a mocker. Proverbs 20, verse 1, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. You want to be wise? Don't get intoxicated with wine. Don't get intoxicated with alcohol. Don't mess around with drugs. You know, and, and I'll go a step further. If wine is a mocker and strong drink a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise, let me tell you a surefire way that you will never... Uh, violate that command in Proverbs 20, verse 1. You will never, ever get drunk if you never, ever start drinking. You know, isn't that kind of a novel idea? You just, hey, that stuff is not good. The Bible says it's not good. And people all the time, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about drinking. It just says don't get drunk. Well, yeah, don't get drunk. And one way to not get drunk is to not ever drink. I got a confession to make. I have not had a drop of alcohol for months, months, 576 months, not had any alcohol. And uh, you say, what's different about you? Uh, you? You must be miserable. You're not drinking. That doesn't make you happy. Solomon says, hey, don't go down that road. That road is a dead end. You're not going to find satisfaction in drugs and in alcohol. Now, alcohol doesn't have an upside. It just has a downside. It just has a downside. You talk to law enforcement officers when they get called out to domestic violence. Drugs and alcohol are almost always involved in that. And you start messing around with that stuff, it will wreck and ruin your life, your marriage, your family, your kids. You lose your job. All sorts of terrible things associated with that. So my attitude is just stay away from it. Listen, there are certain things the Lord said to Cain, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. There are certain things that crouch at the door of your life and my life. Alcohol, drugs, those are two things, stimulants. Those are a thing together, if you put them, lump them in a category, that crouches at the door. If you let that in, 
You think, well, it's no big deal. I can just let that in. I can control that. Maybe you can, but maybe you can't. I still remember having breakfast with a young guy when I was in Houston teaching a Sunday school class. A young guy in his 20s, he wanted to have breakfast with me. He said, I got to tell you something. I said, okay. And so we were eating breakfast. And I'm thinking, what is this big thing he's going to tell me? I wasn't prepared for what he told me. He said, I need to tell you something. He said, I'm an alcoholic. And he said, I wish I had never taken my first drink because I can't stop drinking. And one way that he could have handled that was to never start. But see, he, let, he opened the door. Sin was crouching at the door, and he let it in. And that sin that seemed little didn't stay little. All of a sudden, it was a 500-pound gorilla on his back, and he couldn't get it off. Hey, Solomon says, listen, you're not going to find satisfaction in those things, in those stimulants, but you will find destruction in those things. So, just as uh, a review, satisfaction, it's not found in wisdom and knowledge, not found in laughter and amusement, not found in drugs and alcohol. Well, how about money and materialism? Surely, that is the goal of life, to uh, attain all these things and have uh, so much money and buy all these different things. But he says, hey, satisfaction is not found in money and materialism. Verse 4, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem." Now, he had so much stuff. You can imagine. You can buy anything you want if your net worth is $2.3 trillion. You know, Solomon, if you put him into today's category, he would be the eighth most prosperous nation on the earth as an individual. That's how much he had. And you say, well, you know, I mean, most, here, here's how most people think. What would make you happy? Well, if I just had more money. That's where, that's where our mind goes. It, it, you know, what would solve your problems? More money. And you think about what you could do. If, if we were handing out, if I didn't hand out Vegemite today, but I had $100,000 in cash over there, man, you guys wouldn't have waited till we finished the announcements. You'd have been over there getting that. Nobody has taken the Vegemite. <laughs> just pointing that out. Uh, but we think that will solve our problems. Hey, you need money to live. I need money to live. I get that. You sit down in a job interview and they say, well, a week, what, what would you like us to pay you? Uh, because we can pay you 50000 on the low end or 150000 on the high end. You choose. Nobody's saying, mm, I can't take the high. I don't. 60? No. I mean, everybody would say, hey, if you got that in the budget, let's go to the top, 150. Uh, we need money to live. But here's the thing. Money will not satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. And that is what Solomon is saying. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with, his, with its income. This, too, is vanity. Now, Jesus, when he told the parable of the, the sower, the sower went out to sow his seed. Some seed fell on the road. Some seed fell on the shallow soil. Some seed fell on the thorny soil, the weedy soil. And some seed fell on the good soil. Remember what he said about the weedy soil? He said, when the seed falls on the weedy, thorny soil, it tries to grow, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke it out. Think about that phrase, the deceitfulness of riches. What is the deceitfulness of riches? The deceitfulness of riches is this, that riches will satisfy you. That the, your, your problems in life would go away if you just had more money. I believe it was Ted Turner on an interview, you know, Ted Turner, the multi-billionaire, he said this, 
when they asked him about his success. He said, well, it's kind of like this. He said, everyone thinks that that is the, the be all end all. If you had uh, just more money and if you were wealthy and if you were a millionaire and the millionaire wants to be a multimillionaire and the multimillionaire wants to be a billionaire and the billionaire wants to be a multi-billionaire. It's just more and more and more and more. He said, it's, it's like a paper bag. And everybody is going after the paper bag, trying to get the paper bag. And when you finally get the paper bag, you open it up, and inside, it's empty. It's nothing. The deceitfulness of riches is that riches will satisfy, and they won't. And see, most of us in here, we wouldn't consider ourselves to be rich, so we're still thinking, boy, if I just could get more, if I could get more, then I'd be happy, then I'd be satisfied in life. And the very wealthy person is like, yeah, it's not there. It's not there. Uh, maybe it's if I get a little bit more. Maybe, maybe then. Maybe, maybe if my million turned into 10 million. Maybe then. Maybe if my 10 million was 50 million. Maybe then. You're never going to find it. Hebrews chapter 13. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have, not desiring more and more and more and more. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Therefore, we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear. What can man do to me? Hey, you know why we tend to think if we just had a little more, if we just had a little more, what's going on here? We're forgetting what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I don't need to have uh, more money. I have the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords living inside, and that is enough. Yes. Money and materialism will never satisfy. So he tries Another road. I mean, Solomon is thorough. He's going down these roads. Number five. He says, well, what about, what about sex and hedonism? Uh, the, the, you know, hedonism is just the self-indulgence of sensual pleasure and desire. What if I just gave myself over to that? And he says in verse 8, I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Not porcupines. These are concubines. <laughs> porcupines, not a lot of pleasure there. But a concubine, that's a friend with benefits. And all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. He's going all the way down this road of sex and hedonism to find satisfaction in physical pleasure. And Solomon had 700 wives and 300 girlfriends, concubines. 700. Good grief. You know what that means, guys, when you have 700 wives? You have 700 mothers-in-law. That's, that's a lot right there. I'm just pointing that out. 700 wives, 300 concubines. And the implication is he had sexual experiences with 1,000 different women. Well, many of us look at that and we say, Man, that would, be, that would be so awesome. It's the pleasures of men. The Bible says it's the pleasures of men. And you had that, and, and it seemed to be okay back in the Old Testament. It wasn't. King wasn't supposed to multiply wives. Deuteronomy chapter 17, you can read it. But David multiplied wives. He didn't have as many as Solomon. Solomon did in excess what his father did in moderation. And so Solomon has all these wives. Now, uh, some of them were political you know, David went to war. Solomon went to weddings. Solomon didn't have any war. He just, let's, let's marry this girl, marry that girl. See, this nation won't attack us if I marry the king's daughter. So he did a lot of that stuff. And so the, the implication, I've had sex with a thousand people. Now, we know from recent history, Will Chamberlain, the basketball player who died uh, some years ago, he wrote in his book that he had had sex with 20 
2,000 different women in his lifetime. Somebody did the math on that. He said, well, that's like 500 a year. How, you would do nothing else except that. And, uh, but he says, no, I did. And, and here was the thing. It was a, it was, I think Will Chamberlain was, was pretty much over the top. But I liked what he said afterward. He said, I did that, had all these women in that way. But he said, I learned that rather than have a thousand different women, it's better to have one woman a thousand times. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. You, you learned something uh, to go along with all your venereal diseases. Uh, you know, I mean, as, how would you not? Um, he never talked about that. But here's the thing. You're not going to find satisfaction in those things. And we live in a world today that is totally nuts with sexual immorality. I mean, it's just... It's like we go out on the first date. I don't even have to know anything about you. And where do those things end up? They always end up in a sexual relationship. Well, it didn't used to be like that. Why? Because people had a fear of God. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, let the marriage bed be undefiled for fornicators, those who have sex and they're not married, and adulterers, those who have sex outside of the marriage bonds, God will judge. Amen. That's what he says. Now we think, well, you know, God, he doesn't care about that. He does. I had somebody tell me just uh, a week or so ago, he said, hey, I, uh, I moved in with my girlfriend. I said, you did? Why'd you do that? Oh, yeah, well, I probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah, of course. It, why are you telling me that? You know, it's like, wouldn't you want to keep that to yourself? Uh, I said, you, you're not supposed to do that. Well, yeah, it's probably wrong. No, it's not probably wrong. It is wrong. Let the marriage bed be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. Let me move away from you in case a bolt of lightning hits you. You know, I mean, we have to get back to a fear of God. We, we don't fear him anymore. Now, listen, fornicators and adulterers, God loves fornicators and adulterers. But if we think we can sin with impunity and, oh, God, he doesn't care. He's just, he's okay with that. He's not. And he will judge. And shall, the, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? He will. And so what do you do when you're living in sin? You didn't, maybe you didn't know. And you're like, well, I'm living with my boyfriend. I'm living with my girlfriend. I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. There's a lot wrong with it. You either move out or you get married. But you make it Right. I think I told you the story about the one guy came to me. This was years ago when I was at Champion Force, and he said, I want you to do my wedding. He said, my wife and I want to get, or my girlfriend and I want to get married. And I said, okay, well, tell me about your situation. Well, we've been living together for six years. I said, okay, um, well, that's, that's wrong. You realize that's wrong. He said, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, it's wrong. And uh, he said, but we want to get married. I said, when do you want to get married? We could do it right now. I mean, this isn't like a big thing with a honeymoon. Whoa, we're going to get real excited about that. I said, you've been living together for six years. And I said, so uh, let, what, let's, let's do it now. No, we can't do it now. We've got to do it later because we have family coming in because it's a big thing. It's our, our wedding. I said, okay. I said, well, can you move out? He said, no, I, I, I can't afford to move out. I said, do you have more than one bedroom in the house? He said, yes. I said, will you move into another bedroom? He said, yes, I could do that. And I said, here's the deal. I will marry you on one condition, that you from this moment forward say we're going to be chaste in our relationship and we're not going to engage in premarital sex until we get married, until we make it right. And I said, will you commit to that? He said, yes. And she said, yes. And I said, okay, well, then I'll, I'll do the wedding. And the reason being is because why do you want to ask God to bless your relationship if you're living in sin? You know, we're going to come, uh, we want to come before the Lord on our wedding day and say, God, bless our relationship. And God says, well, you've never done what I've told you to do in your relationship, and now you want me to bless your relationship? I said, it just makes it a mockery. So they said, we'll keep to that commitment. Well, I go to the guy's house three months later, because he was getting married at his house, and uh, we're getting ready for the wedding. He pulls me over to the side. He goes, hey. I said, yeah. He goes, I haven't touched her in three months. So let's hurry this up. You know, 
He didn't say that, but that was kind of his attitude. <laughs> that was one of the sweetest weddings I ever did. The presence of the Lord was there so strongly. Why? Because they said, we're going to honor God. We're going to do it God's way. And God blesses that. Listen, God doesn't want to judge. God wants to bless. And if you quit going your way and start going his way, then he can bless. But listen, you're trying to find satisfaction. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. You're trying to find satisfaction in sex and sexual immorality. You'll never find it there. I still remember this one girl that I knew in high school. I saw her when I was a sophomore in college and we were visiting. And she said she was a, a sweet girl, a good girl. But then she gave herself over to sexual immorality when, toward the end of her high school career. And she told me, she said, you know, sex is not all that big of a deal. It's not all it's cracked up to be. You know, it's just kind of, you know, not, not really a big deal. I thought to myself, you're 20 years old. You're not married. And something that God has kept that's supposed to be so special and so sacred you have so ruined yourself that now you can't even see that for the sacredness that it was designed to be. See, sex is a lot like fire. You think about your house. There's a place in your house that's good for fire. It's not the attic. It's not the hall closet. It's the fireplace. Sex is fire Marriage is the fireplace. That's the only place that a fire is good is in the fireplace. If you let the fire get outside of the fireplace, it will burn your house down. Solomon did that. And what happened at the end of his life? His many wives turned his heart away from the Lord. It wrecked and ruined him spiritually. Satisfaction is not found in sex and hedonism, but there's one last area that he tried. And this seemed to be such a good area, and it was the area of work and achievement. Oh, if I just, if I just put my nose to the grindstone, if I just work, if I just achieve, then I will find satisfaction. Verse 11, thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Verse 17, so I hated life for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is futility and striving after wind. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun." work and achievement. And Solomon said, look what I've made. Look at the, the temple that I built for the Lord. Look at my palace. Look at Israel. Look how beautiful it was. In the days of Solomon, silver was as common as stones, it says. Everything was gold because that had real value. And the gold just flowed and, and the beauty of Solomon's kingdom was incredible. But then he said, but wait a minute, I can't take this with me. You know, it's like the, the person said uh, of the rich person they're reading in the paper, and they said, uh, so-and-so died. They were very rich. And his wife said, well, how much did he leave? And he said he left it all because you don't take it with you. And Solomon's saying, I can't take any of this with me, and I'm going to leave it to someone. And who knows whether that someone is a wise man or a fool. He left his kingdom to Rehoboam, his son. Rehoboam was a fool. Solomon said, I worked my fingers to the bone and I left my kingdom to a bonehead. And Rehoboam, well, he wasn't king very long before the kingdom split. And ten tribes formed the northern kingdom. The two, tri two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they stayed there in Jerusalem. But they were split uh, from that time that Rehoboam took over the throne. Hey, you're not going to find satisfaction in work and achievement. Work is a good thing. But workaholism is a bad thing. And some people, they pour their whole lives into their job and they 
sacrifice their marriage and they sacrifice their family because all they're doing is their job. And Solomon said, you're never going to find satisfaction in work. I love this one statement I heard from Warren Wiersbe, I believe. Both the workaholic and the alcoholic are running away from reality and living on substitutes. You think about that. I'm just going to work, 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 work because I don't want to deal with reality, but I'm going to be miserable in doing this because there's not satisfaction there. What is the more? I wish I knew. I know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the difference in life. He's the one that makes life worth living. See, satisfaction is only found in the Lord. It's only found in the Lord. That's why Ecclesiastes 2.25, Solomon breaks through from his under the sun and makes this statement, for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Answer, no one. No one. You're never going to find satisfaction outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our souls, our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Adrian Rogers makes the statement. He said, why did God make a bird? He said, to fly through the air, soar through the air. Why did God make a fish to swim through the sea? He said, if you take the fish out of the sea and put him in a tree, needless to say, he's an unhappy fish. If you take a bird and shove him down into the ocean, needless to say, he's an unhappy bird. He's not where God intended him to be. He's not in the element that God made for him. Listen, you and I, we were made to worship God. We were made to serve God. We were made to glorify God. And if you try and find satisfaction anywhere but in him, you'll never find it. But here's the thing. And you'll seek me, the Lord says, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And you can find satisfaction in Jesus. The song says, friends all around me are trying to find what the heart yearns for by sin undermined. I know the secret. I know where it is found. Only true pleasures in Jesus abound. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? That's where it begins. You surrender to him. You look to him. He is the pearl of great price. He is everything. He needs to have first place in everything because it's only in him that you'll find satisfaction for your soul. And you'll be able to say with Abraham, I've lived a full life and I'm satisfied in life because my life was lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. As we close out the program today, I want to invite you, if you've never done this, to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. You say, Jeff, what's involved in that? Well, it's simply to cry out to God from your heart to say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now I open my heart to you Forgive me, Jesus, of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll make that kind of a decision and pray that kind of a prayer, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, let me know about your decision to trust Christ. Let us know about your prayer requests. You are important to God and you're important to us. And we're here for you.